My name's Sarah Brennan Kolb, and I'm the director of Good Old Girl. My name is Kyle Kelly, and I'm the cinematographer for Good Old Girl. Texas is the place where so much of the entire West was born. The cowboy is the number one hero, the one who steps in and saves the day. He is our King Arthur. But the cattle kingdom is changing. I was born and bred to be a cowgirl. Matita es un clean. A lo que estudió. Porque ella trae la sangre. There's a lot to be said about the older people saying that my generation isn't coming to the table. It's a lot easier to move to the big city and make a lot of money than to come back and do this. It's not about doing what men can do. It's about accomplishing the same task. I can work like a man and when it's time to be a lady, I can be a lady, and, that, and that's extremely important to me. The old ways won't do anymore. We've got to change if we're going to stay a kingdom. That is the trailer for the upcoming documentary, Good Old Girl, and this is Factual America. Factual America is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for an international audience. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and every week we look at America through the lens of documentary filmmaking by interviewing filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, to find out where you can see our films, and to connect with our team. When we think of Texas, we think of wide open spaces, rugged individualism, the Wild West, and invariably cowboys. But where do women fit into this mix? In their film, Good Old Girl, Sarah Brennan Kolb and Kyle Kelly put this question into the context of present-day Texas. Women are increasingly taking a larger role in the traditionally male-dominated industry of ranching. As we found out, Texas is going to have to change if the legacy of the past is to be handed down to the next generation. We caught up recently with Sarah and Kyle from their homes in Texas and New York. Sarah Brennan Kolb and Kyle Kelly Welcome to Factual America. Sarah, how are things in Texas? Hot. Yeah. And rainy. Hot and <laughs> rainy. Is it, is, it still um, in the, is it still in the hundreds? Yeah, it somehow is still in the hundreds and also just rained. <laughs> how is that possible? Uh, it's a beautiful, sticky, rainy day down here in Texas. <laughs> well... Sarah, you're director and producer. Kyle, um, how are things with you in New York? Uh, it's beautiful here. So, I mean, I think it just rained a little bit, but it's definitely not 100 degrees like Texas. So I'm happy that we are not in production right now. Uh, I mean, things have kind of moved on, but how are uh, you doing uh, some, from a COVID standpoint, uh, uh, Sarah? Yeah, well, it's funny because I, I, I got tested this morning for COVID for an upcoming shoot, and I just got the text oh, message that I'm negative. So, oh, woo! congratulations. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Proud I'm four for four on my, on my COVID tests. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, um, COVID in Texas has been a pretty crazy reckoning of, of our sense of exceptionalism down yeah. here. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot, but I'm really, I'm really grateful for those of us who believe in science <laughs> and um, yeah, how much time we're able to spend mm. outside down here. I mean, is that standard? You Before you do a shoot, you've now got to get tested or is that something you do? Uh, <laughs> it's, something, <laughs> it's something that I require uh, okay. production companies to do now. But yeah, this one, 
um, this next coming shoot is going to be so with someone pretty um, immunocompromised. So I've okay. been I've been on a lockdown for the past five days and getting oh. lots of tests. Oh wow! We'll yeah. To, well, we'll talk more uh, later about your sort of upcoming projects. But what about you, Kyle? I mean, uh, how are things in Yonkers? Um, I mean, things are sort of kind of getting back to normal a little bit in terms of production. I mean, they're still not normal at all, obviously. Like shooting with a mask on for several hours is very annoying. But yeah. Um, yeah. I have not had nearly as many tests as Sarah. I think the only test <laughs> I had the only test I had was before the Axios interview with uh, the president. Um, and other than that, it's been like just be careful and let us know if you have symptoms. We have to like take our temperature and stuff, but I don't think that actually yeah. really matters. Um so, so so what interview was that? The, so I work for Axios and HBO. I do a lot of shooting for them as a freelancer. And uh, we shot the, the one that went viral like three weeks that ago. Interview. That oh, interview. Oh, that <laughs> interview. You know the interview. Uh, <laughs> wow. That was yeah, that was a wild experience. That was, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my COVID story. Of, uh, that's oh. definitely going to get it. That's got to make it into this podcast. So we'll have to... Uh, <laughs> We're gonna, but let, before we go there, uh, let's um, let's uh, go talk about this film. The reason we we have you on in the first place, which is uh, uh, "Good Old Girl," a uh, documentary western following a band of cowgirls as they hustle for land, cattle, and respect across Texas. Says the log line. Um, it was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest, and we were supposed to meet up with you then. And uh, I, I never, I don't think I had the chance to, you also invited us to come up to your ranch since uh, <laughs> South By got uh, canceled, but then pretty much everything got canceled. So um, um, has it premiered um, the film, Sarah? It hasn't, no. It, it, we're, South By is still technically um, our premiere. Um, that was really important to us um, to stay with the festival. But yeah, there'll be, some official public online screenings later later okay. this year. Um, yeah, and we're we're working to also figure out how to do a few of those safely um, in person okay. and outside. Okay, so no, I mean I'm one of the lucky few. I've actually been able to see this 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 great film. Um, maybe you can give us a quick. Uh, I mean we've heard a trailer. Uh, so I think people have a bit of an idea. We've got the log line. Maybe you can give us a bit of a synopsis of uh, what what is Good Old Girl about. Yeah, definitely. So Good Old Girl is a documentary western. Um, it follows three young cowgirls in Texas um, who all come from completely different sides of this very large, diverse state. Um, and they're all in different parts of the industry. Um, and in very different places, but they're all in their own way struggling to carry this tradition forward. Um, and in Texas, there's this crazy statistic that every hour, 2,000 acres um, of agricultural and ranch land get turned into subdivisions and development. So it's this way of life um, that I think all of us in America and all of us who love cinema have grown up idealizing and romanticizing. Um, and it's, it's disappearing. A lot of it is disappearing. And I wanted to make a film that follows a young, diverse female generation um, trying to carry this legacy on. Okay. And um, I want to I explore that a, a lot further. But Kyle, I mean, you, uh, so you're from New York. You, uh, you made it down to Texas on this project. Uh, was it as what you were expecting? Uh, I'm not sure I, you know, knew what I was expecting. I mean, I'm originally from Vermont, so I'm not, like, I'm a little more rural than New York, but definitely not, I was not from, like, the sticks of, of Vermont. We definitely spent some time in the sticks of Texas, so, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Sarah kind of warned me what it was going to be like, I think, um, and I spent so much time down there that I, like, feel like I'm, I'm used to it now. Okay. Uh, I had my big, like, I, I earned my stripes um, when we... Uh, shot skeet and that was like basically like what allowed me to be he on killed the a rattlesnake and i killed a rattlesnake yeah so killed I like, a ra oh my yeah. goodness yeah, yeah. It was wow with your bare hands or no that the one that was in my bedroom i didn't kill it was just in there <laughs> <laughs> that we found out later but yeah found out later. <laughs> yeah that was wow. but you earned everyone's respect on set i'm sure <laughs> yeah exactly 
I mean, yeah, that's Sarah and I were the only ones on set. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's too bad. Because I was going to say that's instant street cred. In, yeah. Uh, in oh, yeah. No, there were videos shared. There was a lot of cred. It was all There's, in one. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, well, Sarah, so as you've, as you've already talked about, you want to, I mean, I, I think you've already touched on some things I'd like to get into about um, how Texas is changing. And um, I think people who our, our loyal listeners know that I was born and raised in Texas, so I have some some perspective on this. Um, my high school was a brand new high school, and it was had been built on what had been ranch land. Just you know, which high school? I was in San Antonio, so I went to Tom C. Clark, and I'm old sure. enough. Yes, so uh, yep. yep. So back then, it was relatively new. That's how old I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was. We used to drive through. To get there, drive through the Chavano Ranch, and the people who owned the Chavano Ranch just started, they would sell off 50 acres here, a few hundred acres there, and another subdivision would get built. And now if you go through there, there's no evidence of that, uh, Yeah. any of that uh, ranch land left. I mean, it's very similar to what you captured with uh, one of the characters we're going to talk about is a young woman in Laredo. Um, And I thought that was... It may not be the most beautiful piece of cinematography from pure landscape standpoint, but I thought it very accurately captured what it's what these areas are are like, or at least have have become. Um, but you're also exploring the role of of women um, in a very what has traditionally been a male uh, oriented industry, certainly in the state. But maybe I, maybe this is a bit of a curveball, but. I mean, what is what is the role of women in Texas history, uh, or what is the sort of the the myth? You know, we have this myth of the frontiers woman, and I think you touch on it a bit in the, yeah. in the film. Oh, I'm so glad you say the frontiers woman. Yeah, I think I think my biggest point that I've always wanted to get across is that the role of women in Texas and the West has always been so significantly bigger and important than we've ever given the space and the credit. Mm-hmm. Um, to explore, which is one of the one of the reasons why I, I knew I really wanted to make this movie. But um, and Joyce Gibson Roach, professor mm-hmm. um, at TCU, who opens the film, was so instrumental in showing me and teaching me that through her writings um, and through conversations that women have women have been in the West and in Texas. Um, from from the very beginning we've we've been responsible for you know the largest and most successful ranch in in the history of of north america the king ranch henrietta king is the reason why the ranch is what it is today we um yeah we we did everything that men did um Mm -hmm. they those women just were never written about um and that was, I think that was one of the most fascinating and frustrating and terrifying, but inspiring things when, when we first started making this movie is that every, every person I talked to when I was kind of exploring um, different characters in the film, everyone knows, you know, a, a cowgirl or a cattle woman. Everyone, everyone has a story of a woman who no one else has heard of, um, who's living her own life. And part of this lifestyle we've just never given or held the space I think in our kind of Mm. our national language and folklore um Mm. to celebrate those women you talk about the frontiers woman um Joyce Gibson Roach who's who's in the film she has this idea that we've had different archetypes of women and that last female archetype that we have in America is the frontiers woman and we've never even bothered to give her a face or a name Mm. um she's been this kind of faceless um figure that we're grateful for because she she suffered through a lot um you know building building what is now texas and the west but yeah i wanted i wanted to fill those colors and i wanted to give a face to those countless women um yeah who history never spent much time on because yeah, I think you're right. There, it, it is faceless. I think what I picked up growing up there was that there was there was this frontiers woman. And when I say myth, I don't mean it wasn't true. I just mean you know the yeah the the, the, the stories. But you the never archetype. had yeah. the archetype. Yeah, that you never had a name put to it. 
Uh, I mean, Texas has probably had more women governors than minute, most states. Um, it's had a had one of the first, if not the first, Wyoming and Texas battle it out about who was first. But um, uh, so there's this. We've I grew up knowing that there were strong women in Texas history. Uh, but I mean, all that said, and what is I mean, what is is someone who's grown up all over and lived all over the all over the state. Um, what was the, what's sort of the reality in your experience in terms of how women are treated? Uh, yeah, these days, these days. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> nuance. So I, I'll preface it by saying this, cause I, I think my experience is different than a lot of people. Um, I was just raised by women. <laughs> like my mom and her close group of friends you know, my dad was a very important part of my life growing up too, but the day in and day out people who I saw making the decisions and making the money and putting food on the table and, you know, guiding my life, like those were all, those are all women. I didn't, I didn't have any male figures in my life making the decisions. And I also didn't have like, I didn't have brothers to kind of fall behind or, you know, I was, I was it. I wasn't, I think I kind of, skirted a lot of that mm. um a lot of what I see my friends deal with and go through but um yeah I mean there's always been I think because Texas is so tied to the land and there's such a there's so much land compared to how many people there are um there's always been a need for for independence and self-sufficiency and that's always been attributed to women to women as well so I think growing up that dichotomy that I learned that I was forced to learn of like we love tomboys in Texas we love them <laughs> we love the idea of a of a woman who can shoot a hog and can you know fix fence herself and ride horseback we love that idea but we also want those women I think in a lot of ways to still, to still fall behind men. And that's, that's something that's never, that I've never really figured out. I've never figured out why we love our women to be so self-sufficient, but we love them to also be beautiful and have perfect hair <laughs> and perfect teeth. And <laughs> the taller the hair, the closer to Jesus, as they say, like we've always <laughs> also had these like very traditional standardized yeah. ideas of what women need to be as well. Um, well, yeah. I think that takes, if you don't mind, I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm actually, but uh, I think that takes us to a very brief little clip. But uh, if you don't mind, I think it's uh, one we have of uh, one of the characters who will meet a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Uh, from the film, but she's one of the main characters, uh, Lemoyne Knox, and um, she's having a well. It's a, about a conversation she had with her dad. So, if you don't mind, let's uh, let's. It's just about uh, I think twenty thirty seconds long. Dad and I had worked cattle, and my dad said, "You know, honey, you don't have to get married." You can have a child out of wedlock. It's okay. Like, you can go get AI'd like a cow. And at that point, I looked at my father and I said, Dad, I'm studying for the LSAT. I think I'm going to go to law school. And he was devastated. Okay, I think uh, that I, I think in an odd way that might illustrate what we've been talking up, about up until now. Uh, as someone who grew up there, I found that one of the most quintessentially Texas things I've heard in a in a long time in terms of uh, it, it's also plays to this sort of Texas pragmatism that I seem to remember. I don't know how much it still exists because uh, I've been away for a while. But uh, her father basically saying, you know, don't worry about marriage. Don't worry about this thing. You can... Um, you know, just get, uh, you can have a baby with <laughs> just by being artificially inseminated. And then her response, I thought was interesting. So her immediate response is, I'm going to go get a, uh, I'm going to get a law degree and be become an attorney. Um, so with that in mind, maybe we, let's, uh, you've got, it's a very character led movie. I really appreciate that. I think there's, um, there's, 
well, I would say four characters. Um, and maybe between the two of you, you, we can introduce them to our audience. Um, I don't want to give away too much because one thing I will say, some of the interviews and reviews I saw did give away a little bit too much, if you ask me. Uh, but um, let's start with, not with uh, Lemoyne, we'll start in the order that they pretty much appear in the film. And that's uh, Mandy, is it Dosses? Yes. yes. Well, can I just, can I say one thing about that the quote? AI line? Yeah. <laughs> Why I Please. love it because it's honestly, it is the most subversive and radical and I think coolest thing that like a father can say <laughs> <laughs> to a daughter, like a father in like a very traditional world yeah. because, you know, Jack is always, yeah. Jack has always left the door open in some ways for Lemoyne to just do whatever the hell she wants. And I yeah. just like, that's why. I didn't want to put any men in the movie who I didn't believe in. Um, yeah. And that's why I put Jack Knox in the movie because he's secretly, and I think just one of the most radical um, progressive people that, that I've ever met. And yeah, that's and, it. I just want to plug, plug my respect for well, Jack Knox. Well, I'm glad to hear that because you'll be happy to know that the other one of the other clips we've only got a couple others, but that I would like, if it's okay, like to play in, includes him on camera. So uh, yeah, he actually yeah, talks to camera. Love Jeff. So, um, <laughs> so well done. Yes. So, but back to Mandy. Um, so, Mandy, uh, maybe talk a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about who Mandy is. Yeah, Kyle. Do you want to? You should take. You should take Mandy. Uh, I mean. I think Mandy is like sort of what I expected when we first set out to make this movie. Yeah. <laughs> like Sarah was telling me about these, you know, frontiers women and these, and these cowgirls and I was, and Mandy just sort of like fits the bill. You know, she is just, she's just a badass. I mean, that's like the only way I can really describe her. Um, one of my favorite, I don't know if this is giving away too much. This is one of my favorite scenes, but uh, I went down alone one time when, when Sarah, uh, was out and we had to keep film some stuff with Mandy and um, she was working alone because her ranch hand had left and you know because there's constant turnover and just watching her in her truck put the truck in drive and climb out as it's moving <laughs> climb onto the back and feed the you know feed the cattle behind the truck it's just like and then she climbs back in while it's still in drive yeah, yeah, exactly. it's just amazing yeah. she's just like a it's just a total badass and just like a lovely 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 person and she's, yeah so fun i'd me. say like i've learned i learned so much from mandy just about right so i i was for a time living and working on that ranch for mandy and so just like i cannot tell you how many things she taught me just about ranching and how how yeah. to respect the land but um also just like the thing I love about Mandy is that she is so hardworking and she is so tough and so fearless. And yet she is so willing to be emotionally honest and, mm -hmm. and vulnerable. And that's something as a young woman, I like, I don't think I would have, I'm still trying to learn it and everything that I know about it, I've learned from Mandy and I'm just, I'm so grateful to know her and to have worked with her for all these years. Cause mm -hmm. she, She's a true example of like, you can be tough and you can go after what you want and follow your dreams and be independent, but you're also allowed to, to say what you want and say what you need and, and follow your personal dreams um, as well. And yeah, that's, that's what I've always loved about her. But I think that, I, I think all the women were like, sort of like documentarians dreams in that way. Like, they, yeah. <laughs> Like, I think it was partially because our, our crew was, it was just Sarah and I on almost, you know, we had some other people that came in and out, but for the most part, it was usually just Sarah and I. And so I think that allowed for a lot of that emotional availability that like you don't always get when you're working on, um, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. invasive films where you're just spending so much time with someone. Um, yeah. And she fits a lot of archetypes as well. I mean, that, but don't know, maybe not always thought of in terms of, of females, but uh, she's originally from Virginia. Um, you know, there's this long history. We, you know, there's people who have stickers on their pickup trucks that say native Texan and things like that, but there, there's a long history of people coming to the state and being quickly 
uh, being accepted and treated as if they're native sons or, or daughters. She's, uh, as you say, she's a ranch manager, but yet she's got this, um, I think I made a note of it. I thought besides that scene in the truck, um, which I noticed, noticed as well, um, there's one scene you caught where she's, she's extremely nurturing with just, she's like a cow whisperer, if I may, may put it that way. I mean, it's, uh, and it gets, we've done a last season, we did the um, Cowboys, a documentary portrait is a documentary that came out recently and they, they focused on large outfit ranches, but um, you know, there's a lot of crossover there in, in terms of, you know, cowboys, essentially you can't be a good cowboy or cowgirl if you don't love cows, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think Lemoyne's father made something about it where, where we chase the grass or something like that. I mean, in, in that same doc, they talk about the, uh, they're all basically grass farmers, really, when yeah. it comes down to it, you know. All we are is grass people. Yeah, grass people, that's yeah. right. Um, so I think um, if, so let's give Mandy her due. Uh, we're not going to be able to give everyone their due, but I thought Mandy, uh, um, we have a little clip here that would uh, just talk, some, I think touches on all these things, um, where she uh, talks how she wants to be a, uh, a ranch manager and what her, her dreams are. My dream was to be a ranch manager. If I was to think of me myself, that's what I wanted. But um, ranching is a family thing. And, and my ultimate, my ultimate dream would be to have a partner that wants the same. And that, that has been a huge struggle for me because it means a lot to me. I want a husband that I work beside. Okay, so the next uh, character that we can look at is um, uh, Lemoyne Knox. Uh, so if, uh, if Mandy represents East Texas, because you do a compass point thing here with uh, your four <laughs> main characters, uh, Lemoyne represents West, and as someone who grew up in San Antonio, they're all North Texas. Or, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, she's from Coleman. Um, unlike Mandy, she's born into the business, but uh, we've already seen the, the clip with her where she's uh, struggling with uh, where, which direction her life takes. Do you want to say a little bit more about Lemoyne? Yeah, um, Lemoyne is the very first person uh, who came on, who came on to the documentary. Um, so a lot, this movie would not exist if it weren't for, for her and her belief. And I think one of the, one of the things that I've always loved about Lemoyne is her ability to live in two different worlds. Um, and to live in two different worlds with a lot of grace and a lot of compassion for the other side and I think that is something that this entire country needs more of <laughs> desperately and um yeah I wanted I wanted to not just look at generational transition um mm. from like a newcomer's perspective and also someone who who's lost a great deal of it I wanted to look at the deep sacrifices that it takes to keep a legacy going. Um, and I think, I think the film does accomplish that, um, the weight of expectation, but also the fact that with a lot of expectations come a lot of love too. And the expectations put on the Moine are not just because she's the heir apparent, but because her community and her parents love and believe in her. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and believe, believe in the ranch, but yeah, a lot. You have to make sacrifices to keep that going. And that's never fair. And I think women have to make more sacrifices. Um, yeah. Okay. To keep a legacy going. To your earlier question about like sort of my expectations of Texas versus reality, I think at, like on her face, Lemoyne's story seems almost like the most traditional one. But I think that the interaction with her and her family is I think one of the ones that like was really the most beyond my expectations because just mm. because of how like it seems like such a traditional arrangement and then just like getting to know jack especially and, and like sarah said he has like a progressive heart um you know and also <laughs> uh, just the fact that lemoyne was 
like so in two worlds, as Sarah said, was just so yeah. fascinating. It's just to yeah. see the area of the law that she was taking on as a way of like continuing her family legacy while also trying to maintain the ranch was really interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, m men get to carry legacies on. That's, that's what's built into the entire Western genre. That's what's built in, like, how our names work. Like, mm -hmm. legacy belongs to men. Um, and Lemoyne was a story that I wanted to explore of like what happens when that incredibly important and rich legacy, um, when a woman in turn gets to carry that on. Okay. Well, I think that brings us to one last clip, if you don't mind, which uh, I have written down here at legacy next to it. So this is all very appropriate. Um, it's all about uh, keeping the ranch in the family. And we get Jack on camera as well. And Hunt talks about how he wants this, uh, the ranch to remain in the family for, well, forever, basically. She needs to uh, uh, keep it all together. Because all we are is grass people. I feel that there's a, a responsibility um, for me to come back to the ranch and to work here. Well, it's been in the family over 100 years and needs to stay in the family forever. All right, so then we, uh, we, we head south, I was thankful to see, and we've got Martha <laughs> Santos uh, from Laredo. Uh, and now she's interesting because uh, like you say, you've got all the, the each, each character represents a different sort of, not just region, but um, they're all young, but slightly coming at it from a slightly different direction. Maybe you can uh, tell our listeners more about uh, Martha. Who wants to go in f first with that one? Kyle, you want to I'll give me a go? I'll take Martha. Yeah. Okay. I'm from South Texas too, so I have a special. <laughs> Where from? Corpus Christi. Okay. Yeah. Um, Where'd you go to high school? I went to high school in Austin. I didn't stay that long in South Texas, okay. unfortunately. But um, yeah, I Martha, I think, is the future. Um, both of ranching and of Texas in general, I think she represents what we need, um, which is someone who has incredibly deep roots in the land and in the history, um, but also very much understands that there is a very large world that is also just as important as we are, no matter how much Texans we like to, we like to think otherwise. But Martha's family actually came to Laredo um, before Texas even existed. Um, they were Spanish settlers. They had a Spanish land grant. Um, yeah, so they, they've always been a very powerful, powerful family in Laredo, but as it's hard because they built that city. They helped build that city. So much of the success of Laredo is because of the Santos family. Um, but ironically, as that city grew piece by piece, um, their land was zoned from in the United States, it'll go, a piece of land can be zoned for agricultural use, and then the government has the right to rezone it um, as commercial use. And when that happens, you can't farm on it anymore. The only thing you can do um, is sell it, basically, to big businesses um, or the government. And so piece by piece, that's, that's what happened to Martha's, to Martha's land. And they're incredibly strong, intelligent business people. So you know, they're able to, to, um, to pivot and to, to keep going. But Martha came at a time in her family when, when that land is pretty much all but gone. And yeah, she, her father passed away when she was very young and the idea of carrying on her father's legacy, um, through the land and through ranch management, I think is something very important to her. And and yeah, and as you I think alluded to previously, this uh, ties to the land. Yeah, they don't own land anymore, but she's she's obviously drawn to it, and yeah. into a life in this in this industry. Yeah, it's so funny. We don't 
get too much into it um, in the film, but Martha is, she went to finishing school in Europe. Um, she, you know, she's incredibly well educated. She's been all over the world. Um, and it's funny because she finished, she finished etiquette school. It was like an international school um, and came back and went to college um, for ranch management at TCU, which is how she knows everyone else. So okay. Okay. she's, her thing has always been to better understand the world and to better understand how her piece and her legacy fits within it. Um, and I think as times change, and I think this virus has showed us, like we, the entire globe is so intimately intertwined. We need someone like Martha who understands the bigger picture um, and who can, who can carry the good things of our legacy forward. Um, yeah. Well, as she says in the film, she's like that perfect middle link between the people who are actually working on the ground and the people right. making policy, right? Yeah. So having someone with both, you know, both sets of background is is crucial. Yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. And I think, um, and then one, the other, if there, if there's a fourth main character you've already alluded to is uh, Joyce uh, Gibson Roach, who uh, yeah. represents the North in, in one way, uh, but she's your sage, isn't she? She is, both in the movie and just in life in general. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came across a lot of Joyce's writings um, when I was doing research for the film, and she just writes so beautiful. She wrote a book called The Cowgirls, which I highly recommend. Um, yeah, she just wrote so beautifully of the West and of the different female figures she had found um, in writings, and I just, I loved her prose and her approach and her ideas so much. I, like, I sucked it up one day and I wrote an email uh, at the very beginning and I was like, you don't know me, but I think you're really cool. Would you be interested? <laughs> I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest fan. And then she responded. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, and then I had to like calm down my fangirlness. Um, but yeah, definitely. I, I think in everything, I think looking to the older generation is so important. And I didn't, I didn't kind of want to weave the story about the future of Texas without being guided by someone who so deeply and intimately understands its past. Um, so yeah, that's where Joyce very graciously um, came on to the project. And we interviewed her in, in a saloon in, um, in the stockyards in Fort Worth. All right. um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think, no, no, no. I think uh, if, if, if you don't mind, I think that takes us to a, a little break for our listeners and then we'll be right back um, with, uh, with uh, Sarah and Kyle. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Uh, welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Sarah Brennan Kolb, the director and producer, and Kyle Kelly, director of photography and producer of the documentary Western Good Old Girl. Uh, Sarah, how did you come up with the idea for this film? Um, well, so I, I grew up watching Westerns with my dad. Um, I love them so much. That was kind of like what we, that was our thing that we shared together. And my interpretation of a Western was very loose. I would watch everything from Lonesome Dove to B movies to Walker, Texas Ranger. I just like, I loved, <laughs> I loved <laughs> anything <laughs> Western related. And um, you're the first yeah, filmmaker I, to put Walker, Texas Ranger as an influence. I, I yes, and Wayne's World. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne's World. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not not quite a western but if you give me enough wine i can make the case for it um but yeah i i loved these stories and i loved yeah i loved the idea of the west and the romance and the the heroism the idea that someone small could go on a journey and become something much bigger um i love that and i grew up 
and, and a pretty conservative um, upbringing. And I realized pretty early on that as a girl, those stories weren't for me and that I was going to play a very different wor- role in my life. Mm. Um, and that kind of, yeah, that understanding and that kind of shattering of like what I thought my hero's journey was going to be, I think, I think affected, affected me a lot. This idea that, you know, who you are on the inside as a woman isn't who you can always present to the outside. And Mm -hmm. so I went about my life and I was fortunate enough to like end up making movies as a career. And um, yeah, I, I was really poor and really young and really cold in the winter in New York after I moved up there and I I just needed a break and moved back down to, my mom was living in Kennedy in South Texas at the time. And she, um, she had befriended a woman who owned a cattle ranch and was running it by herself after the recent death of her husband. And I was able to befriend and shadow her. And I thought, that was kind of the first, the first inkling of the project. And when I started talking to Kyle about it, cause that's when I realized like, Oh, women can do this. <laughs> cause I remember being like, wait, you actually can be a cowgirl. That's the thing you're allowed to do. Like everyone told me that wasn't possible. And here I was meeting women who kind of made it possible. And so that became, that became my idea. I thought maybe this is a chance to take this genre that I love so much um yeah and and reclaim it for for the women because westerns always like to use westerns like to use women as pieces of landscape to like break up the landscape like they're either they're allowed to go places on a journey but they have to be going towards a man or like Mm -hmm. they're the places where a hero's journey ends um or keeps going so they've never been really heroes and like active active people going going on their own quest so that's that's what i wanted to do okay and was that before you were working for for mandy yeah that this was all years years before yeah. um before i met mandy so i yeah i i spent some time on that ranch in kennedy and then i started meeting lots of women who were cattle women and trying to convince them to be in the movie and they'd be like absolutely not but um one of them said you know tscra which is um Mm -hmm. the cattle raisers association in texas um who play a really big role in the industry they have a conference every year and one of the women said you know what no i'm not but you should go you should go to the conference you should get more educated and um maybe maybe you can meet people there so so just for the record i mean we have these three main characters that are uh, actual you know cowgirls or ranchers or however you want to describe them but for the record there's a lot of cattle women out there oh there's so many <laughs> there's yeah. so, so many, many don't want to be women. in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so is that how you ended up because that's one of the questions how do you, is that how you end up with these three these are the three that said yes is in a sense in essence <laughs> no a, a few others said yes which i was very grateful for but um yeah these three so i actually the one was the first woman that i met i flew in to that conference in dallas um they put that i was from brooklyn on my name tags <laughs> just like <laughs> felt like a dummy from the get-go um but yeah the first panel that I walked into um at cattle raisers it was a panel on generational transition and I was like that seemed pretty apropos so I went and (laughs) the only person under the age of like 50 on that panel Mm -hmm. happened to be Lemoyne and um so I like got up the nerve to talk to her afterwards and we ended up we were wearing the exact same cowboy boots. So that was, <laughs> that which, was my in. For the record, which, what kind of cowboy boots were you wearing? Oh, they're Ariats. Um, um, they're very, <laughs> they're Ariats. They're like special edition Ariats um, that have neon calavera skulls on them. Like the, the sugar candy skull with yeah. neon feathers um, wow. and arrowheads on the side. <laughs> 
They're very subtle. They're very tasteful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that begs the question, Kyle, how did you get involved with this? Uh, well, Sarah and I met on a fiction film, actually, on a fiction feature. And she and I just like, you know, it was one of those super low budget um, mm -hmm. indie features where the crew either learns to really love each other or really hate each other. And luckily for both of us, we learned to really love each other. Yeah. Um, and then she asked me about this short she wanted to make in Texas. Uh, so we went down. I ever use the term short film for the <laughs> we, can, we can check the record on that. But we went down and we basically just started filming and then it just, um, we just didn't stop for three years or whatever it was. Um, we, I think the reason we, that I stayed on the whole time is first of all, I just would love the subject matter and the potential for the film, but also just like our working relationship was great. Like mm. we, we had a very good uh, sort of, I mean, we just jive really well together. Like, uh, you know, yeah. Sarah's willing to do the heavy lifting that's required when you only have one person other than, you know, you only have two people on set. And so she never shied away from like doing whatever job needed to be done. And she also knew that I would shoot in any scenario, yeah. uh, except when I get sick in the back of cars shooting for too long. <laughs> Basically <laughs> the only time I would put the camera down. Um, but yeah, it's just like sort of started from another project and, has grown into a great friendship. So let's carry on with that because you, you've you're the director of photography. You're I think you're doing an excellent job of capturing modern day ranching or modern day Texas. Certainly an element of modern day Texas. I mean, first of all, was it? I mean, we had we've had people, guests on before who talked about how dangerous it can be to film on a ranch. Uh, did you what? Did you find any uh, any concerns there? I mean. I don't think I ever, I mean, Sarah's a really great spotter also. Um, so like there was never really a time that I felt like sketched out by, you know, snakes or anything like that. Cause she was always like watching me and watching the monitor and watching me. Um, I spent a fair amount of time around cattle and stuff just from being from Vermont. So like yeah. the, I think the size of the animals might freak other people out, but it mm -hmm. didn't really bother me. Um, That's a real thing. And it was, I, I do want to say, and one of the things why I was so grateful to have Kyle in order to get on the ranches um, was a really hard task and like convince people yeah. that it would be okay. And one of those things was figuring out how to film without putting stress on the cattle right. um, or on the land. And so Kyle was really instrumental in that I, I didn't, I didn't trust a lot of people from New York or even from Austin to come to any mm. of these places. Um, yeah. And so like Kyle was able to help me figure out a way that didn't cause any impact to the land or to the animals. Well, and that really led to the style too, because we like, we almost yeah. never had a tripod, um, which yeah. probably took a couple of years off of my usable uh, cinematography life. <laughs> I made him do oh. all of the interviews handheld. Oh, like, also, I was 24 when I made that decision. I was like, this is going to uh, be so unique. But like, you know, so we, we, like, we were just really low impact in terms of our, our footprint. You know, like, I didn't have an easy rig or anything because we yeah. didn't have, like, these giant contraptions that would freak out both the, the subjects that we were working with and, you know, the animals who were obviously, like, also yeah. subjects in their own right. And so just had, like, a pretty minimal <laughs> setup. Well, wow. well, I think you. I mean, there's some um, uh, some great scenes. Um, obviously, I highly recommend people seeing the seeing the film. But uh, you know, you've got Mandy with the. I think we've already alluded to Mandy with the cattle. Um, Lemoyne with her dad and dad's friend, or maybe it's an uncle. I don't know. But uh, out dove hunting or skeet shooting, whatever they're doing in that. A couple of different scenes. Uh, Martha walking along, uh, all those scenes around Laredo. The rodeo, so you did the Coleman rodeo. I thought that was very well well shot. Was that, uh, uh, what, I mean, was that a challenge or how were, were people up for that? I, I mean, like in terms of the actual filming of it, it wasn't it, like, that's like maybe the easiest thing because it's yeah. shooting a lot of things over and over again. But yeah, yeah people, I guess- Freaked out, Sarah, you think? I mean, Say what? Do you think people seemed like bothered by our presence there? I don't seem to recall that. No, I mean, the really cool thing about LeMoyne's mom, Duty, is that whatever Duty says, 
ghost. Okay. And Duty is a former rodeo queen. So we rolled up and we let everyone know that we were with Duty Knox. And they yeah. kind of let us do whatever we wanted. I, I, and I think that's what I, I didn't say, uh, ask it very well. I think that's kind of what I was getting at. There's, yeah. the, and I won't go into deep, we won't go into details about that scene, but uh, I thought the shots of the rodeo and everything it was it was an interesting juxtaposition between i mean i'll just put it out there growing up when you if you said cowgirls i would have thought rodeo queens and barrel you know girls could do barrel racing you know and yeah and then there was some sort of version of uh uh calf roping but it was like with goats or something like that you know yeah. but uh but that was pretty much it so i thought and then you have the scenes when they're all the you know, women out on the horses and the rodeo queen is kind of the the current or at that time current rodeo queen and then juxtaposed with you've got like mandy on the ranch and and uh and martha and uh, and lemoyne i thought it was an interesting sort of uh, it was i thought in that sense that you caught a i thought you caught a lot of an essence of uh thank you of, of that's, the rodeo. So, that's so good to hear i am um, that was definitely the hardest that was the hardest scene in the edit for sure. Cause I think um, a lot of notes that I got back through the edit were like, everyone wanted me to pick a side. They either wanted me to show the rodeo as this like horribly gendered thing or just like this absolute glorious thing that I love so much. And here's what all y'all should think about when you think of Texas. And I just, I sat on the fence because that's, how I feel that's how the rodeo how I feel about the rodeo is how I feel about Texas in general like I love it so much I go to every rodeo that I can I go to like my friends roping which like isn't even <laughs> there's no fanfare to that at all but um I love it I love it so much I love the history and the story and the ceremony that we put in a rodeo and you know rodeo queens and the women you see riding in rodeos that is the hardest job in a rodeo like what they're able to do on the back of a horse takes more skill than any bronc rider a cap roper will ever have but the issue is that like that's all they give us the problem is the problem is not barrel racing and rodeo queens all of that stuff is beautiful and it takes so much skill and mm. i have so much respect for the history and for the women who do it i think the problem that I find is that that's all, that's all that we're given. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope one day that women are able to compete in whatever, whatever competition in the rodeo that they want. And I hope men can also be on horseback with beautiful hats riding around. <laughs> I'd make a great rodeo king to start out. You would be <laughs> such a good rodeo king. Um, yeah, that kind of tug between those two things is why I included the rodeo rodeo in the film. I love it so much, but I do want it to change. I should say also that that just that, that the rodeo is one of those great scenes that like I had no idea how it was gonna <laughs> fit at all. And I was told Sarah it was like we should spend our time elsewhere. And as with every almost every other decision made in this film, she was right. And <laughs> that's why she's the boss. <laughs> I work for her. Because uh, she knew what she was doing the whole time. Okay. Well, on that on that note, since Sarah, you've you've obviously said you you've the vision. Uh, you're the boss. What do you mean by documentary western? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think I don't know. What do you think, Matthew? I think it's a pretty it's a it's a western. I wanted um, a lot of people told me it's not a western, but I don't really care. A western to me is a landscape film about a hero's journey. Um, I think it's definitely a revisionist Western, but I wanted to tell personal stories um, against a landscape. And I wanted to present women as heroes um, that you root for and go intimately through their journey. So that's what I mean. That's a documentary Western. And uh, what is next for this film? Because you've, in theory, you've had the premiere at South by, but uh, can you tell uh, our listeners what where they is where's what's the best chance they're going to have to to see this? Yeah, Kyle, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to answer that? 
I mean, I think, you know, we should just be honest that unfortunately, like COVID has thrown everything sort of up in the air and we're still yeah. very much trying to figure it out with the rest of the industry. Um, yeah. it's unclear now, like what the festival landscape really looks like and if there are going to be more screenings mm. or, and distributors are still sort of up in the air of, you know, everyone is sort of walking on a tightrope trying to figure out which way everything's going to go. So, I mean, we, we definitely are going to, it's one of Sarah's um, big things that she's always wanted to do with this film is sort of use it as like an educational piece that we could show at like state fairs and rodeos mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But of course we have to wait for those to happen again. Yeah. Um, and then of course we'll, you know, we'll eventually have distribution through streaming and such, but right now it's still working on those details. Yeah, I mean, good. I'm glad we're doing the honesty thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was it's... like, either be honest or I won't say anything at all. <laughs> no, we, I, we, um... I hope for nothing but honest here. I mean, what I say yeah. is I, I asked about, I kind of asked it a roundabout way, but I've, I had stopped asking the, what's the new landscape of documentary filmmaking going to look like, which I used to ask. And I mentioned that to one of, uh, one of the guests, uh, actually the first, uh, first episode of this season, which is uh, uh, launched just recently. Um, and he basically said, no, I, there's a podcast I listen to every week. They ask that question every single time. <laughs> and everyone says the exact same thing. They have no idea. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen with festivals. So, I mean, we've had, you're not the first people to come on to this podcast who've got a film that shot, made, was ready to premiere at a festival and are now just waiting to see what happens. Yeah, I think it's hard because every day we'll get a random email to our website and then it'll be like, I want to see film. When when does it come out? Like, you know, like all I always, just, yeah. I always you know, respond very nice. <laughs> like, Thank you so much for your interest. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's so hard because it's like, yeah, I get Facebook messages and emails every day um, from people asking and I like, I promise we're not going to stop until we figure it out, but it's, um, yeah, it's not the time. I don't know why it's not the time and I hope the time is coming very soon, but I think a lot of, a lot of people with a lot more money and a lot more influence have to figure out a couple mm -hmm. of things before, before we're able to do what we want with the film. Okay. And, um, where, uh, well, what do you, I mean, you said you want to do it as an educational piece. I mean, what do you hope to achieve with, with this film? Yeah, I, I've always thought about this film as like a Thanksgiving table movie, um, as something as like, when you sit down, at least for me, a lot of my family disagrees with me just about everything. Um, <laughs> And I think, at least in, in America right now, as I'm sure y'all can very easily see from yeah. across the ocean, um, the divides and the ability to communicate with people who we disagree with or who, who might come from a different world than us um, have basically all disintegrated. And my hope in this film is that you know, coastal America can watch this and understand the hardship and the strength and the determination that it takes to make a living in rural America and to understand that. And I also want all of the girls in small town America to know that they have a right to their own legacy and for them to be able to have those conversations and want those things from their family. Um, yeah, I hope it's we can all talk about it over too. the Thanksgiving yeah. table. Yeah. It's important for men to see it too, right? There. I mean, that's what we've always talked about is that it's like... Yeah. Yeah. I've always, I've always hoped that women would see themselves as heroes mm. and men would understand that women can be heroes. I've, yeah. Thank you, Kyle. I've always, I've always wanted that. I've, I've wanted to introduce this idea of self-determination, self-determination for women um, to a pretty male audience. Okay. And I mean, that's a, I think that's a very, uh, grand idea. I've, I've it's, <laughs> it's not, no, no, no. I'm just thinking back to, uh, I, not to go into details, my own family history and some Thanksgiving and not immediate family, I must say, but well, 
maybe sometimes, but uh, there have been some, I think this is something, I, I think, yes, things are, uh, I mean, this is one of those years where you just want to turn around and I have asked literally one of our guests, what the hell is going on in America right now? Uh, but, uh, but, you know, this thing has been going on for a while, uh, for d decades, where you've, it's been almost impossible to have certain conversations at uh, Thanksgiving yeah. tables. So um, um, you're right. Maybe that's all, that's part of what's happening is that it's just sort of this all has built up over the years and people have just not been talking or certainly haven't been listening. Um, but also, yeah, I think, I don't think a documentary film will ever change the world ever. Yeah. But I think a film can give an audience a story and a metaphor to express their own emotions and their own needs through. And so I, yeah, I hope, I hope that everyone on both sides of the spectrum in the United States can see a part of themselves in the movie. And I think the biggest problem we have is that we've just stopped listening to each other's stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, and maybe if there's a story like this out there where a little piece, a little piece of a lot of different people are represented, um, maybe it'll maybe it'll make us at least turn around and face each other before we start yelling at each other. Well, well, at least you're doing your part. And so I said <laughs> I don't want to derail this or end on this note. But one last one of the last questions I ask because unbelievably we've, we're coming to the end of our time uh, together, but. Uh, uh, Kyle, you did mention an infamous HBO uh, interview. Yeah. I mean, is that, I mean, what was that like being on set? Um, and maybe give listeners, those who maybe have been hiding under a rock, a bit of a context of what we're, what we're sure. talking about. So um, about a month ago now-ish, um, I was on the crew that filmed the interview with Donald Trump at the White House that, with Jonathan Swan that's now like a meme or many memes. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a pretty surreal experience just because I've, I've shot at the White House grounds before and we, I actually shot an interview with Larry Kudlow about a month before then. Okay. Um, and at that point it was really interesting because no one in the White House grounds was wearing a mask like at all. Uh, like there was like the, you know, one random person here, one random person there. But when we came back a month later to just film uh, the president's interview, he had gone on like a week before and said that everyone should be wearing a mask. And lo and behold, of course, everyone is now wearing a mask. Um, so that was the first thing that I found really interesting. And I think the next thing, and this is like, maybe this is too like optimistic, but um, my interaction with every single person there, like staff at the White House, like the various people we, we worked with was all very positive and like civil. Um, so that was great. Um, being in the room was weird. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's strange to be filming something that you can, that as you're doing, you can tell is going to be like one of the defining moments of a, of a president's uh, term, possibly mm. presidency. Um, and, you know, it's like you're focusing, I was focusing, focusing so much on the camera work that I was, tr you know, you can't get too involved, but there's times yeah. when something happens and you just go, oh my God, I have to, you know, like when he pulled out the charts, I was yeah. like, oh, this is a close up moment, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a wild experience. Yeah. And so you, you could sense, I mean, like you said, you, you've, you've, you've got to get, get this in the can. You got to film it up, you know, but while you're behind the camera, you could sense there's, wait a minute, this could be a, well, yeah, a pivotal think, moment. I think you could tell that um, it was, it was more of an honest, like conversation than you'd seen a lot of times, because most of the time mm. that the president gives interviews, it's, it's with, very uh, you know, sympathetic right. uh, news outlets yeah. and so and not that you know Jonathan is you know he's like just a phenomenal reporter he's just yeah. like asked really you know he was following up consistently and and you could tell that there was some tension that there normally isn't in this sort of thing and and but also to the president's credit like he wasn't he didn't say fake news he didn't like walk out um, which mm -hmm. he very easily could have he gave us more time than he originally said he was going to give us um, and also, oddly, afterwards, despite the fact that the interview really blew up, yeah. he, he didn't say anything negative about it, which was wild to me. Um, I think because he actually was like, I think he just respects Jonathan Swan because he's known him for, you know, he's yeah. been uh, interviewed by him before. 
Yeah, so it was it was a really <laughs> it was it was weird to be uh, in the room where it happened for sure. I, I, oddly, that's all sort of. I was going to say, how does this fit into anything we've talked about up till now? <laughs> yeah. <But laughs> I was even thinking we're going to have to edit this out. I mean, what is, I mean, as much as I want to get it in there, it doesn't really fit, but oddly it, there's something a bit positive and optimistic about, about that story. I think, I mean, that fits in with sort of who knows. I mean, you know, we don't need to get into, I don't want to get into a political conversation right now because it's not what the, but it is a, that is very interesting. That's, that's, that's a, Anyway, maybe we should leave it at that. Let's say, uh, but I will let Sarah pipe in if she wants to say something about it. You don't have to. I do, but it would probably take me way too long to. Okay, well then, then but I, will, I do want to give you the last. At least the final word on the movie. <laughs> I do want to give you the last word on the, that's exactly right, uh, Kyle. You definitely get the last word. And, and so, you know, I usually ask guests, what is this film really about? Because all great docs are more than just their immediate subject matter they're about all can you know and this is about so you've already mentioned it's about ranching it's about generational change it's but to me it's it's really about texas uh, in a lot of ways and sarah how do you see texas changing for the better and for the worse yeah that's a great question um i'm gonna first off start off by saying that i love texas like an obnoxious amount um, <laughs> you can you can ask anyone um i think i think texas is changing in a lot of really good ways i think texas is i mean you look at the last election in houston um it was the most diverse you know group of elected officials i think in the entire history of our nation um i think Texas in a few generations is no longer going to, the face of Texas isn't going to be white. And I think that's, I think that's a good thing. And I think the real face of Texas never, has never been white. And yeah. I think, I hope that Texas will change in the way that we're able to talk about race and to have those real conversations. And I hope yeah, I hope that I hope that we embrace that because our strength has always been our diversity and history um, and our cultures. But I also think I also think Texas is changing for the, a lot of ways for the worse. Mm -hmm. I look at I look at the landscape of Texas, which is you know what the film film is about, and the good things about Texas are disappearing. Um, Texas has always been different because we've been a group of people who have always been tied to the land. No matter, you know, there's six flags over Texas. We've, we've seen a lot of bloodshed. We've seen a lot of wars. We were our own nation, you know, um, politic has never, has never been too important to us. The land has always been important. And now to see the next generation of carpetbaggers in a way come in, and see that landscape disappearing is is really terrifying and i hope i hope people see that and understand how important our land how important protecting our land and conserving our natural resources is okay well i said i would give you the last word so i am going to give you the last word <laughs> um and just to say to our listeners that if they want to follow what uh, kyle and uh, sarah are up to next uh there are links in the uh, show notes that you can uh, link, look to to see what uh, projects you're up to. And uh, we will talk about those projects hopefully another time. That would be uh, if we haven't scared you away. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Sarah Brennan-Kolb, the director and producer, and Kyle Kelly, the uh, director of photography and producer of Good Old Girl. Uh, also, a shout out to This Is Distorted Studios here in Leeds, England. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures.
Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.